Hi, and welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you in the uh, conversation. Our last caller was talking about the issue of whether a treaty can trump the Constitution of the United States, and the answer to that clearly is no. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. Now, our government is bound by a treaty uh, that is signed by the president and ratified by the Senate. Every treaty has to be ratified by a vote of 67 senators. But if that treaty were to be in conflict with the United States Constitution, then it would be invalid because the Constitution, not a treaty, is the supreme law of the land. Well, honored and pleased to welcome to our decision maker line, John Rosemond. John Rosemond is an author of a number of Christian bestsellers, including Parenting by the Book and The Well-Behaved Child. John, welcome to Focal Point with Brian Fisher. Brian, thanks a lot for having me on your show. You bet. You know, John, we were talking in the last segment. I don't know if you heard this story about a father who was denied he's being challenged in a in a custody fight with his wife because he would not take his four-year-old son to mcdonald's his four-year-old he wanted to take his son to this place where they usually go this four-year-old son threw a temper tantrum i want to go to mcdonald's the dad says no we're not going to mcdonald's in fact his dad said you can eat anywhere you want but it's not going to be mcdonald's get through a temper tantrum and said well then i'm not going to eat the father took him up on it the mom found out about it and basically went to the judge and said, look, he's an unfit parent because he wouldn't take my kid to a McDonald's. And, you know, one of the observations I made, John, is probably every parent uh, that's ever lived has faced a, a faced a decision like that where you've got a, a willful child that won't do something that he's being asked to do by his parents. And, and I know that these are the kind of things, parenting by the book, the well-behaved child, these are the kind of issues that you take on. They are the uh, the the further situation uh, in that story is that the father took the child back to the mother's house or the mother's apartment building, and the father is a very prominent, well-known New York uh, attorney. This is not some slouch, and he takes his son out to dinner every Tuesday night. He sees him every other weekend. It's a standard visitation arrange- arrangement. And um, he just felt that the child had been eating too much junk food lately, so he said, well, we're not going to McDonald's. The child threw a tantrum. The father wouldn't relax, took him back to the mother's apartment. The mother called the psychologist who has been assigned by the court to do a custody evaluation, and the psychologist has told the court, that the father is an unfit parent because he wouldn't take the child to McDonald's. And, Brian, I am a psychologist. I'm licensed by the state of North Carolina. And, uh, first of all, I tell my audiences all over the country, uh, most of the problems in contemporary parenting, um, which are problems that our great-grandmothers couldn't have imagined parents having, have been caused by advice from psychologists and other mental health professionals. And this is a prime example of the fact that the mental health professional professions, in my estimation, do more harm than good to the American family. Now, one of your books is Parenting by the Book. Uh, let, let's uh, maybe use this little situation as a little bit of a template, John, and have you, you break it down. If we're going to parent by the book, let's look at the situation. You got a four-year-old. He's willful. He's uh, stubborn. He uh, refuses to do what he has been asked or directed by his parent to do. If we're going to parent by the book, what what should a parent in a situation like that? What wisdom is there from the scriptures to draw that might help deal with a situation like that? Well, first of all, the scriptures tell us that foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. And that's in Proverbs. I forget the exact reference, Brian, but foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. And I point out to my audiences that the word bound is a powerful word. It doesn't just say there's some foolishness in the hearts of children. 
Um, it doesn't say that children are sometimes foolish. It says that foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. And the proper thing for a parent to do in a situation like this, an outburst of the foolishness that is bound in the child's heart, is exactly what the father did to uh, just unequivocally refuse to give in to the child's emotional outburst. Um, but this is, you know, this is psychology for you, that you have a psychologist here who said that now because of this incident, because the father did not give full credence to the child's emotional outburst, that the father is an unfit parent. It's just an outrageous thing. Now, one of this is this is kind of a side angle, John, and I, I don't know if you would be prepared to, to weigh in on this, but another observation I made about this circumstance is how this issue now has become a become an issue in the custody battle uh, for this child. And one of the observations I made is since we have gone to no-fault divorce, and the whole purpose of no-fault divorce, we were told, was to keep acrimony out of divorce proceedings. Divorces get bitter. They get ugly. Let's, let's, let's bleed off that animosity. Let's let people get divorced for any reason that they, they want. Well, what's happened, it seems to me, John, is, is that all of that animosity that was supposed to go away has simply been transferred now into the battle over custody, and children then become these innocent pawns in the crossfire between parents who are angry with each other. Well, yes, and, and uh, one of the other things, factors, if you will, Brian, that plays into this is unfortunately the American child has become the American idol over the last couple of generations. I'm a member of the last generation of American children who were not idols. Um, we were not at the center of attention in our families. Our parents fully recognized the need to discipline us. And very, very unfortunately, today's parents have bought into a psychological vision of their children, and they put their children at the center of attention. And under these circumstances, two things happen. Number one, parenting differences become more pronounced. And now parenting differences are a primary reason given for divorce. And number two, when divorce does take place and there's a child involved, probably 95% of the time there is a battle over the issue of custody because we're, what they're battling over is the idol. You know, we were talking earlier, you know, today's Veterans Day, and uh, my uh, producer, or my director, uh, John, ha had a father who flew combat missions in World War II at the age of 20. And what we were talking about is how we have sort of artificially, I mean, he was assuming enormous responsibility beyond the battlefield, putting his life at risk when a lot of guys aren't old enough to know how to tie their shoes in today's culture. And it seems that we have artificially delayed and prolonged adolescence in a way that's really harmful to our culture. We have delayed toddlerhood. It begins with uh, children coming to school five, six years old, <laughs> excuse me, who are still exhibiting pronounced toddler characteristics, short attention span, impulsivity, temper tantrums, defiance uh, in the face of an instruction from a parent or a teacher. And uh, the mental health professions are uh, capitalizing on delayed toddlerhood or perpetual toddlerhood, as I sometimes call it, by manufacturing completely unscientific um, diagnoses and capturing these children as permanent patients with the myth that these problems, which are obviously parenting issues, they didn't exist 50 years ago. Um, that these problems are due to genes that didn't exist 50 years ago and biochemical imbalances that mysteriously didn't exist 50 years ago. Brian, my first grade class in 1952, I don't know how old you are, brother, but my first grade class contained 50, that's five zero children, one teacher. We came to first grade not knowing our ABCs. We finished first grade reading at a higher level than today's children, and that is statistically verifiable. And the reason has nothing to do with IQ. We were not smarter. But 
who came to school having already learned to pay attention to women and having already learned that when a woman says, this is what you're going to do, that is what you are going to do. And today's mother, by the culture, by the mental health professions, by this new psychobabble, has been completely stripped of her authority over her child. Hmm. And this is a major, major problem in America. Talking here with John Rosemond, author of two Christian bestsellers and more, but the uh, two books we're talking about a particular day, Parenting by the Book and The Well-Behaved Child. John, I'm sure a lot of parents listening to us, both mothers and fathers, really resonating. What you're saying is really resonating with them. They'd like to get more information uh, about how they can get more tools and more counseling, more insight on how to be better parents. Uh, tell our folks where they can get more information about your ministry, where they can get their hands on these books. Um, I have, my ministry has two websites. One is John Rosemond at AOL.com, and the other is Parent Guru, P A R E N T G U R U. And make no mistake about it, the guru that I'm trying to uh, help uh, occur is the parent, not me. So, ParentGuru.com. Hmm. And one last uh, comment, John. We just got about 45 seconds left. But what would you say sure. to parents who have really done their best, they've actually tried to parent by the book, they've used the counsel they've gotten from the scriptures, and they've been good parents. I mean, nobody's perfect, but they've been good parents. They've been consistent, they've modeled the kind of, and yet they have an adult child who sort of goes off into the weeds. What would you, and, and, and parents beat themselves up over that, uh, what would you say to them? 30 seconds. I was talking to a parent yesterday who was beating themselves up over that, and I told them, look, the scriptures are very, very clear. Parenting does not produce the child. Read Genesis chapter 3. The only perfect parent there is creates two children who disobey his first instruction. You are an influence in your child's life. You are not the single determining factor. Our guest has been John Roseman author of two great books on parenting, Parenting by the Book and The Well-Behaved Child, as well as other resources. Get more information by going to John Rosemond at AOL.com. That's Rosemond, R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D, John Rosemond at AOL.com or Parent Guru. John, thank you for taking time to chat with us, and God bless you and your ministry. Thank you very much for having me on your show, Brian. Anytime, and God bless your ministry as well, brother. Thank you. John Rosemond, author of Parenting by the Book and The Well-Behaved Child. Be back in two minutes after these brief messages. Stay with us. Focal Point AFR Talk.